And I have the um, pleasure to um, then um, introduce to you uh, Sue Cork. Sue joined the College of uh, Early Childhood Educators as the registrar and CEO in April 2011. In her previous role as Deputy City Manager at the City of Toronto, Sue had the corporate oversight of various programs, including the childcare system of the city, which is actually the second largest in Canada, second only to Quebec. This involved responsibility for 57 municipally operated childcare centers and purchase of service arrangements for 740 childcare programs. We're very proud of Sue at, uh, at the college. She recently is the recipient of the Heinzman Leadership Award. This is an award for outstanding leadership in the public service. Sue was recognized for her commitment for putting the needs of customers first. With her career in public service spanning 30 years, she's not only of my vintage, but she also has held progressively senior leadership positions in the provincial government, including assistant deputy minister, deputy minister within the Ministry of Community and Business Services. We are delighted to have Sue as our registrar and C CEO. She is a keen wit and a keen sense of humor. She's an amazing leader. And her solid experience comes with a strong belief in the role of regulatory bodies to serve and protect the public interest. Further, not only as our leader, but more importantly, as a grandma, she has a keen appreciation for the value of early childhood educators and early learning and care. Please join me in welcoming Sue. Thank, thank you very much, Lois. I just have a couple of things to say about her introduction. First of all, you can see that I began work when I was three. That's the first thing, so vintage apart. Uh, and the second thing is, is that I get a lot of field work at the weekend with my uh, granddaughter, Charlotte, who is 22 months old. So uh, I've been following her progress as I've been in this job, and uh, I feel like it's field work and a, a good orientation. Uh, I'd like to say good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to members and also council members. Uh, I'm very honoured to be here tonight in my role as Registrar and CEO of the College of Early Childhood Educators. I've been with the College now for eight whole months uh, and I'm still in the learning stage. I'm not a registered um, early childhood educator myself, actually I'm an urban planner but I've never actually done it, so, uh, but it's good for integrative thinking. Um, but I have been in the policy field for very many years and I've had a lot of regulatory experience. It's a very busy time for early childhood educators uh, I, and uh, in the policy and service delivery area in particular. And there are many issues and challenges in the sector and I hear about them all the time. I am attuned to what it is that's going on in the sector for you. But in many respects from fresh eyes, from my point of view, it's never really been more exciting. Um, so tonight I want to talk to you about a particular trend which is that of professionalism and what it means for early childhood educators. In putting this presentation together, I've relied on a lot of sources, uh, most of which are very well known in the field. But of particular recent interest is a book by Stephanie Feely, which is entitled Professionalism in Early Childhood Education. And so that's actually a very interesting book. It's an American book, and she writes about all of the things which early childhood educators need in order to be professionals. And you know what? We have all of those things in Ontario. So it's really worthwhile reading. Um, so we've really come a very long way um, as early childhood educators in the quest for professionalism. Once upon a time, people who cared for and educated other people's children were servants, actually not that long ago. They were nursery maids, or with a little bit more status, they were nannies. But popular culture has always recognized the formative influence of those people. There are some very famous names, obviously Mary Poppins, which is playing in town, incidentally, for any of you who want to go see it. And I watched it on television with my baby uh, at the weekend. Um, there is also Maria in The Sound of Music, Anna in The King and I, Robin Williams is one of my favorites as Mrs. Doubtfire, <laughs> there's Tony Danza, for those of you old enough to, to watch that. And more recently, Prince William's nanny, who is Tiggy Legwork, who got a lot of press during the wedding. Um, babysitters and daycare workers, childminders and childcare workers, lots of common identifiers for people who are responsible for young children when their parents are somewhere else. But I want to read you a quote from Stephanie Feely. Until the late 60s, it was generally believed that intelligence was fixed and that experience had no role in the unfolding of children's inborn capacities. These ideas led to the belief that caring for children 
required no special knowledge or skill and could be done by servants, although best done by mothers. Well, for ECEs, and particularly those of you in this room, we have a very different understanding of what it takes to work with those hungry, plastic little brains. There has been a quantum leap in the appreciation of how important it is to invest in high-quality resources and human capital in the very early years. So how did that happen? How did we do it? In the past 10 years in particular, there's been an explosion in child development science. Whether we call that neuroscience or epigenetics, epigenetics or the science of human development, that understanding has exploded. Formal professional recognition has gone hand in hand with that, which isn't to say, as many of you know in this room, that the desire for professional recognition is new. It's not new. For many, many years, advocacy organizations such as AECEO and AFESIO have been pushing for legislated recognition of the ECE profession. But the dramatic scientific findings have given the profession the evidence basis, the push, if you like, that it needed to come into legitimacy. And the critical piece of this research is the piece that says biological pathways developed in early childhood influence health, well-being, learning and behavior across the life course. And that a stimulating, play-based, loving and secure environment enhances learning in early years. Prominent Canadians such as Fraser Mustard and Charles Pascal and Mary Gordon have taught us much in this regard. Taking this one step further, politicians and policymakers have understood that the key to societal health and stability is the investment in individual early learning. So it's not just good for the child and its parents, it's good for everyone. And better still, investment in early learning and care is amenable to policy and program intervention. Invest now, save later. Economists began to understand exactly the power of this value chain. And all of these understandings have come together to make early childhood learning and care and integrated children's services a key policy plank of the current provincial government, as you heard Minister Broughton say. And that together has catapulted early childhood education into a recognized profession. And we've seen some wonderful examples in Ontario over the past few years. The Best Start in Early Years programs, Toronto's First Duty, Healthy Baby, and of course, more recently, Full Day Kindergarten. And the concept, if not yet the reality, of a seamless day. This is a good moment, actually, to pay homage to Dr. Fraser Mustard, who passed away recently. It isn't an overstatement, really, to say that we probably would not be here today talking about professionalism in the early learning and care sector if it were not for the wonderful innovative work that he pioneered over his lifetime. It was a very sad coincidence that the launch of the Early Years Study 3 happened within days of his passing. And this publication is an excellent primer on the evolution and state of children's services. And this particular page that I'm showing you here is actually on the uh, college's website. But to go back to the importance of an evidence basis for investment in early childhood learning and care, it has resulted in a specific pedagogy underpinning the curriculum for early childhood education. Now, I've never worked with educators before in all my 30 years, and I've had to learn a new language. Of course, all of you know what pedagogy means, but I had to look it up. A pedagogy is a philosophy and practice that supports the understanding of how learning takes place. And the specific pedagogy which underpins early learning and care is a play-based pedagogy. The provincial government's elect framework codifies this, has become a touchstone for many of you in this room, informing your practice. And I just want to have a quote uh, from this. This is an educational approach which builds on a child's natural inclination to make sense of the world through play. Where ECEs participate in play, guiding children's planning, decision-making and communications, and extending children's exploration with narrative, novelty, and challenge. So hand in hand with this science basis and specific pedagogy has come the privilege of self-regulation, which is another critical piece in the professionalization of the sector. And with self-regulation has come the College of Early Childhood Educators, and with the College of Early Childhood Educators has come me. 
So the college has been in place now since 2007. Um, Lois mentioned that we were at 33,000 something uh, at the end of our fiscal year. Uh, today, uh, Laura informed me we are at 36,127. So we are growing, we are growing all the time. But what does professional self-regulation have to do with increasing professionalism in the sector? This is where I'd like to actually read another little short quote from uh, Stephanie Freely. She says, an occupation wishing to exercise professional authority must find a technical basis for it, a certain exclusive jurisdiction, link both skill and jurisdiction to standards of training, and convince the public that its services are uniquely trustworthy. Self-regulation is a privilege granted to occupations deemed to have professional status. And a profession is based on the mastery of a complex body of knowledge and skills, in turn informed by science and learning. Early childhood educators are trained through a minimum two-year OCAT diploma, and we've discussed the body of evidence-based scientific research which underpins the curriculum and the pedagogy. When the college assesses eligibility for registration, we look at nine vocational outcomes which prospective members must have achieved, including, and uh, please note the parallels with the elect principles, ability to plan a curriculum based on a thorough understanding of child development, ability to plan and implement individual programs and curriculum to meet the developmental needs of children, ability to utilize a variety of observation techniques to enhance work with children, ability to maintain responsive relationships with individual children and groups of children, and some are beginning to argue that perhaps even more training may be required to enter this profession, but currently a two-year diploma is the benchmark. There's a lot of literature on what it means to be a professional, whether you're a doctor, a massage therapist, an ergonomist, a pharmacist, or whatever, or an early childhood educator. And key concepts that run through the literature on professionalism are as follows. So first of all, we have judgment which is exercising professional judgment, thoughtful, reflective, balanced decision-making. The second is quality, a commitment to professional standards. Third is accountability, taking responsibility for one's behavior and the impact of behavior on others. Ongoing education, the commitment to professional development, staying abreast of the field, maintaining excellence. And putting service above personal gain. Recognizing that the object of one's service is more important than the personal benefit to be derived. Those are key concepts in professionalism. And this is how self-regulation works. There are about 40 self-regulatory professional bodies in Ontario. Most of us in this room receive services from someone who's the member of a regulatory college. For me, it's massage. <laughs> the more that I can get, the better, uh, dentistry, medical services. For others, it may be physiotherapy, accounting services, and so forth. Self-regulation works the same way for all of us. Through a variety of means, primarily through adherence to professional ethical standards and strict eligibility criteria, a profession guarantees to the public the trustworthiness and high quality of its practitioners. And in return for this guarantee, society grants them through legislation a monopoly over their scope of practice, and an autonomy in their practice through self-governance. And by self-governance, I mean that the profession forms a governing council made up of elected members, and often, and in our case, appointed members, and sets the rules for its membership within the parameters of its enabling statute. And it's very important to note that a self-regulatory body is not an advocacy body for the profession. Its job is to promote the public interest on behalf of its members. Just to make that point a little bit more clearly, we've put together a bubble diagram. I don't think you can probably read the details of it. Um, and what it basically does is it tries to point out the relationship between the college's mandate and the many, many difficult issues that are swirling around in the ECE sector at the moment. So for example, there's a shortage of affordable childcare spaces almost everywhere in Ontario. We care very deeply about that as human beings, but from the college's perspective, it could mean that there's press pressure for unlicensed childcare and unregistered childcare workers, and that the standards of practice for early childhood educators are not being met, which would result in poor quality childcare. Another example is the impact of full day kindergarten. 
From the college's perspective, this creates pressure for continued competency programs. To take a third example, there are RECE shortages in some parts of the province. This raises concerns for the college about title protection, standards of practice, and again, the potential of unregistered childcare workers. So all of these concerns from the college's point of view have to do with the quality of early learning and care, professionalism in the sector, and the interest of the public. <clears throat> and I'm often asked, as Lois actually was a little bit earlier today, uh, whether or not the college has an interest in working conditions um, and, and pay uh, disparities in the EC East sector. Well, the college is concerned about that, but largely from the perspective of recruitment and retention of high quality professionals to serve our families. So the college's mandate means, and this is important because I want you to understand the difference between a regulatory body and um, advocacy body. The college's mandate means that while as human beings we care very much about these issues, we act as regulators where these issues impact on professionalism, misuse of title, unregulated workers, curriculum quality, and so forth. And you have uh, excellent professional associations which will advocate uh, on your behalf in these areas. So just going back to the necessary conditions for self-regulation, we said that one of the defining conditions was that the profession had to have a monopoly over its scope of practice. For early childhood educators, that scope of practice is found in the Early Childhood Educators Act. It's actually in the law. So the law says the practice of early childhood education is the planning and delivery of inclusive, play-based learning and care programs in order to promote the well-being and holistic development of children. If you're working within the scope of practice, you must be a registered ECE, properly qualified, with minor exceptions, you cannot work in this scope of practice if you're not registered. And shortly, the college will be issuing a professional advisory on the use and misuse of the protected titles uh, of ECE and RECE and their French equivalents. So put together, these are all the pieces of self-regulation which reinforce professionalism, and they all have the force of law. So at the top left, we've talked about the defined scope of practice, and that's in the legislation, and the protected title is in the legislation. The Code of Ethics and Standard of Practice, in place since February 2011, is in place through a college bylaw. There's a public register on which all ECEs must be identified by name, as stated in the legislation. There's a registration process which assesses eligibility through criteria spelled out in a regulation. There's a complaints and discipline process established in the legislation, deals with the violations of professional misconduct criteria established through regulation. The point I'm trying to make here is that this is not discretionary stuff. This is all stuff which is pieces of self-regulation which have been put into place through the force of law. Those of you in this room who are registered ECEs will be familiar with the online public register. If you are current or have been a member in the past, your name will be on this register. Parents, employers, and friends will be able to see if you are a current professional. And a click on the member's name will reveal whether or not there's been any disciplinary action or whether terms, conditions, and limitations have been placed on your status. The college is made up of 24 members. Uh, we could play Finding Waldo, or whatever it is, and see which ones are in the room. <laughs> um, you probably can recognize them. 14 of our council members are elected from eight different regions of the province. 10 are publicly appointed by the Lieutenant Governor in Council based on recommendations from the Minister of Education. Members of Council serve in a staggered way for two or three years at a time, and we began in June our second permanent Council. Each Council member serves on one or more committees. We have nine committees, five statutory committees, meaning that the legislation requires us to have them, and they are complaints, discipline, fitness to practice, registration appeals, and executive committee. The four other committees are elections, nominations, registration, and standards of practice, and we have non-council committee members on those committees. Council meets once a quarter. Other committees feed into this governance cycle. The Code of Ethics, which I'm sure you've all memorized, I feel that you must have all memorized the Code of Ethics, um, is one of the key planks in the self-regulation framework, and it reinforces the professionalism expected of the sector. And it was developed over a period of 18 months with a lot of consultation. And it's a key deliverable of the last council. It reflects a core set of beliefs and values. And uh, they're fundamental to the members of the profession and should guide their practice and decision making and behavior. The Code of Ethics discusses professional expectations in the context of responsibilities to children, responsibilities to families, 
responsibilities to colleagues and to the profession, and responsibilities to the community and to society. And again, when I read it with fresh eyes, I see the parallel with the elect principles. Well, when you're a professional, um, you're an ambassador for the profession, and your hat never really comes off. Uh, it's like being a doctor, actually. When you're a doctor in your community, everybody knows you're a doctor, and they look at you as if you're a doctor. So this governs how people see you in your community, and it ought to result in a language of respect. So for instance, if you are a registered ECE, um, and with due respect to the gentlemen in the audience, you're not the girls, you're colleagues. You're not an assistant, you're an early childhood educator. You're not daycare workers, you are early childhood educators. You don't work on the floor, you work directly with children. You keep your personal feelings and your grudges out of the workplace, and you put the letters of your title after your name on work-related documents. If you have a business card, or if you sign correspondent to a parent or to a colleague. Behaving like a professional, back to those qualities of professionalism that we talked about earlier, is it means you have a strong work ethic, you meet workplace expectations, you dress and speak and communicate appropriately. You have a strong moral compass, knowing what is right and wrong in the workplace. You keep a strong positive attitude, you don't tolerate or enable toxic or discriminatory relationships in the workplace. And you're reflective and open to continuous learning. A commitment to professional development and ongoing learning to stay abreast of developments in your field is a key component of professionalism. I don't need to tell you any of this. I'm just really learning it for myself. But what if an RECE is not behaving like a professional? And Linda has talked about that. If you're worried about the behavior of an RECE college, you, colleague, you can call the college. We're not the child care police, but we are authorized to act on complaints about RECEs. You may be advised to put your concern in writing and start a formal complaint. Remember, it's the reputation of the whole profession that's at stake when someone violates the professional misconduct criteria or doesn't uphold the standards of practice. Under the legislation, employers need to tell the college if an RECE has been charged or convicted, as Linda mentioned. And under the Education Act, school board employers need to tell the college if an ECE, RECE has been terminated or would have been terminated had they not resigned instead. Uh, this this uh, slide talks a little bit about the college's complaints committee, and I'm not going to go into it because I think that Linda, in her report, did a very thorough job of that, and we can always talk about it uh, afterwards if you'd like to. To date, we've only had one disciplinary hearing, which we held in November. Uh, so after three years and 36,000 members, we've only had one disciplinary hearing. There are a few more coming, but we've only had one so far. So just to finish up, um, I've tried to describe the growing importance of professionalism in the field of ECE and the role of the college in contributing to the status of the profession through the privilege of self-regulation. It is a time of dynamic change in the ECE field and there are some downsides and I've just, just put two which have to do with funding and no national childcare policy, which is a shame. Um, but on the upside, there's never been more respect for or demand for RECEs. You heard from Minister Broughton, the provincial government is committed to the ongoing evolution of the profession. The emphasis on modernization of the early learning and childcare sector, together with the further development of frameworks for early learning and childcare integration, bode very well for ECEs. And the range of career opportunities for ECEs is expanding. We're seeing new graduates staying more often in the sector and older graduates returning. The program standards for the ECE curriculum at the colleges are under review and the new professionalism will be reflected in the changes made. And the governing council of the College of ECE is keen to embark on its next round of legacy projects now that the code of ethics and standards of practice are in place. And this will include a focus on professional development and ongoing education. So thank you very much for listening to me in my maiden speech. I appreciate it and uh, thank you. So this will uh, conclude um, our meeting and presentation for tonight. I would like to say merci, thank you, miigwech. I trust that you know a little bit more than when you came in here tonight. Please take a copy or, or see a copy on our website of our annual report. It really is um, a piece of, of really good work. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much. Good night.